Good evening. I'm Dick Milius, Chair of Alaska Common Ground, and I want to welcome you to tonight's discussion of the food systems sector of the Anchorage Climate Action Plan, exploring local solutions to our climate crisis. We would like to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this area, the Denina people. The land that Anchorage is situated on is the traditional land of the Denina. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Denina people, past, present, and future. We will have one more Zoom event in this series delving into the municipality's climate action plan, consumption and solid waste on April 29th, that's a Thursday, also at seven o'clock. You can register and find out more about these events on our website where you can also find a recording of our previous events discussing buildings and energy, as well as land use and transportation, and we will put the links in chat. We'd like to thank our sponsors for this series of events the Alaska Conservation Foundation, the Alaska Center, Solid Waste Services, and Cook Inlet Keeper. We'd also like to thank our partners, UAA APU Books of the Year, who is co-hosting this event tonight with us, the Anchorage Public Library, League of Women Voters of Anchorage, and Renewable Energy Alaska Project, also known as REAP. We cannot conduct the work we do without the support of our members and donors. If you would like to support events like this, please consider becoming a member or making a donation online at Alaska, or excuse me, at akcommonground.org. We'll put a link in chat. You can also remember us when you file your PFD and pick, click, give. Remember the deadline for filing your PFD is next Wednesday. A couple of housekeeping items. Everyone's audio has been muted this evening except for the presenters. The event is being recorded in case you or your friends want to watch it later. If you want to ask questions or provide feedback during the event, we are taking questions and feedback through Zoom's chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll collect your questions and the moderator will ask them after the panelists' presentations. The event will run until about 8.30. Tonight's moderator is Micah Hahn. Dr. Micah Hahn is an assistant professor of environmental health within the UAA Institute of Circumpolar Health Studies. Her work focuses on understanding the health impacts of climate change and working with communities to develop locally relevant adaptation and resilience building strategies. In order to address community needs, Dr. Hahn's prior work has focused vector-borne focus address, excuse me, vector-borne diseases, air quality, wildfires, food security, safe transportation, and energy use. Prior to joining UAA, she was an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Climate and Health Program. Micah received her joint PhD in epidemiology and environmental and resources from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her MPH, I guess that's a Master's in Public Health, and Global Environmental Health from Emory University. Outside of the research world, Micah can be found running mountain trails or exploring, exploring Alaska by pack raft. And now I will turn the program over to Micah. Awesome, thank you so much, Dick. Um, I really appreciate the introduction. Um, and as Dick mentioned, I'll be your moderator and MC for the evening. Um, I and the rest of the planning committee are totally excited to welcome you all tonight and are truly jazzed to hear from all of our great presenters. Um, I'm going to start off by giving a short introduction that includes some background on the Anchorage Climate Action Plan for those of you who are not familiar. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how what we eat and how we get our food contributes to greenhouse gas emissions so that the connections between climate change and our diet are hopefully more clear before we launch into the panelists. Um, and then we'll go to our panelists who will each have four minutes to tell you about their organization and how you can get involved. Our intent was to give you a smorgasbord of ways that you can be involved in our local Alaska food system and reduce the carbon footprint associated with your diet. Um, after our panelists present, we'll move into the Q&A. And as Dick mentioned, feel free to put questions that come up for you in the chat throughout the presentations. We'll be taking note of them and address as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the evening. So with that, I'll give you a very brief glimpse of who you'll be hearing from tonight. Um, one of the Alaska Common Grounds planners will also put this list in the chat so that you can follow along in the program as the panelists um, give their talks. 
This event will be recorded and the PowerPoint will be avail available on the Alaska Common Ground website after the talk. So you can go back and look up the organizations or the contacts of the folks who presented um, if you want to follow up afterwards. So the presenters are going to fly by. So try to take notes, but no worries. We'll have some resources that you can go back to after the after this evening. Okay. Um, so before we get started, we have a warm up question. It's kind of late in the evening. Hopefully you guys have eaten or are eating dinner while you view this, um, but we wanted to get a little warm up. So if I can get everyone to either on their phone or on their computer, go to slido.com and you can either, you can either use your phone and take a picture of that QR code up in the left hand corner, or when you go to slido.com, there will be a space where you can enter this number. 90115. Oh, I can see someone, someone, a tech savvy person's on it. So we want to know what is your favorite Alaskan food? We're celebrating the local Alaskan food system tonight. So let's see, what do you guys um, like to eat? Maybe some of you are eating some Alaskan food uh, here this evening. Oh, we got the, oh, that's perfect. We got the big number. That's what you put into your slider when you get there. Okay, so we have people are liking salmon. Ooh, chugach, the matsu potato chip, chugach chocolate. Yeah, that's one of my favorites too. Um, all kinds of berries that comes up, blueberries and thimbleberries, I see. Um, muskox. Uh, I'm involved in the fishing industry, so I love seeing king salmon and cod and uh, herring, herring eggs and halibut. That's awesome. Um, gosh, our, uh, our freezer is getting bare, but we have a little bit of... Um, of meat left in our freezer from last year. I see people are putting things like bison and muskox, um, ptarmigan. We have a few of those from the spring. Matsu carrots. Yeah, I saw Pam's in the um, in the chat when we first logged in. Micah Han smoked salmon. Holler. <laughs> Huge points for whoever put that one in there. Um, raspberries. Nice. Awesome. I mean, guys, this is this is why this is going to be so fun because we have so many good foods in Alaska, um, and it's going to be great to hear more about um, how we can all be involved in the food system and really access all of these foods if you haven't already. All right. So, intro to the Anchorage Climate Action Plan. Okay, so this was collaboratively collaboratively developed by the municipality of Anchorage and the University of Alaska with input from hundreds of Alaskan residents. Um, there are seven sectors in the Anchorage Climate Action Plan, and those both provide a framework and help organize the, the plan. So as Dick mentioned, Alaska Common Ground is putting on this series of events to help Anchorage residents connect with local resources and learn how you can get involved in the Climate Action Plan. And of course, tonight we are talking about food systems um, here in the state. So when we were developing the Anchorage Climate Action Plan, this was really a unique sector. So one of the key things that we took away from this process is that unlike things like buildings and energy or land use and transportation, there really is no Department of Food Systems at the municipality. The Anchorage food system includes a complex webs of organizations, businesses, and food producers. And one of the things that I think is really exciting about the food system sector is that it's one of the easiest areas that you, residents of Anchorage, can engage because as eaters of food, you're one of the most important components of the food system. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the connections between the food system and greenhouse gas emissions. So food production is responsible for about a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. We'll talk a little bit about where in the food system those emissions come from, but before I do that, I want to highlight the enormous impact of food waste. About a quarter of the food that is produced worldwide never gets eaten, either because it spoils somewhere in the supply chain or because it's thrown away. So that means about 6% of total global emissions attributed to food are from food that's never even eaten. So if we put that in the context of national emissions, food waste would be the world's third largest emitter behind China and the US. So this is really a plug for the April event about consumption and solid waste, where we'll talk a lot more about how you can eliminate food waste from your household. 
Okay, so now going back to those greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with food, let's blow them up and see where they come from. Um, the biggest chunk, about 31%, come from livestock and fisheries. So that includes the production of methane from cows, manure management, pasture management, or fuel from fishing, from fishing vessels. Crop produ production is the next biggest chunk, whoops, about 27%. Most of this is from crops grown for people to eat, but it also includes crops grown for animal feed. And these emissions come from things like the application of fertilizers or emissions from agricultural equipment. Land use emissions down there in brown, about a quarter of, of emissions associated with the food system, happen when we cut down forests and grasslands that were storing a lot of carbon, we call these carbon sinks, and then we turn it into, into farmland. Um, and then the smallest percentage up at the top, about 18%, are all of the emiss emissions associated with the supply chain. So things like processing food, packaging, and transporting it, getting it where it needs to go. So just breaking this information down can help us think about where we can adjust our own diets to decrease our personal uh, carbon footprint. So to lay it out really simply, there are a few things that you can consider if you're trying to cut back on carbon. Um, first, we already talked about food waste, and that will be the upcoming topic, the topic of the April event. Um, in addition, you could potentially make some changes around what you're eating, where it's coming from, and how it's produced. So first, let's talk about what you're eating. So in one of my earlier slides, but we saw that when you're holding an apple or a package of ground beef or a beer, there are carbon emissions that came from across the life cycle of that food, starting with the land use changes needed to grow the food, all the way over to processing and transportation and packaging. A key takeaway point from this evening is that there are different, there's a different carbon footprint associated with the production of different kinds of food. So here's a big list of foods, and these lines basically show how much greenhouse gas emissions are associated with the production of each of these foods. So we can see way up at the top, we have beef. Um, you can see that land use changes in brown, um, or sorry, land use changes here in green, the methane associated, pr produced by cows here in brown, and then the use of farm equipment to, to produce beef all create a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. As you move down this list, you can see that other red meats and dairy are also up high, followed by pigs, fish, eggs. And then down at the bottom is where we start to see some of these plant-based foods, which are associated with the lowest greenhouse gas emissions. So some cities have enacted things like meatless Mondays, maybe you've heard about them, um, which basically help encourage people to opt for more plant-based foods, such as veggies and grains, and decrease the amount of meat they're eating in an effort to, to decrease the carbon footprint of your diet. So looking at this kind of chart helps you see why that, that type of program can make sense. So I can't emphasize this enough, shifting part of your diet away from farmed meat can dramatically reduce your carbon footprint. Usually recommendations are to move to a plant-based diet, but in Alaska, we're really lucky to have lots of options for wild protein as well. And we're gonna hear from, from some great panelists who will provide information about learning more about opportunities for hunting and fishing education in Alaska, if that's not already something that's part of your lifestyle. A question that comes up a lot of, is whether it's better to eat local to reduce your carbon footprint. We can see that the greenhouse gas emissions associated with transportation, which are shown in these little red bars in each of these lines, are really a pretty small piece of the puzzle. For most foods, it really accounts for less than 10% of emissions. So for things like farmed meat, you really make a bigger impact by just trading out farmed meat for wild protein or plant-based foods, rather than opting for a, a local version of that product. But this equation changes a little bit when you go down to the bottom of the list and you start looking at these plant-based um, foods. For these foods, where and when you buy these foods are really the most important consideration. But of course, this is it's always really hard to make generalizations and it really depends on where you live. So what follows are my general guidelines for decreasing the carbon footprint of your diet if you live in Anchorage. And remember, eliminating food waste and decreasing your consumption of farmed meat are key steps to take first if you really want to make a big impact. So after you've done those things, you can start to think about these other more nuanced um, changes to your diet. So first, whoops, 
Um, a lot of our food and anchorage comes by barge or truck, but for the products that are shipped by air, emissions can be substantially higher than these other, than the products that are shipped by boat or freight. And of course, it's really hard to know which products got here by air because it's not labeled that way when you're in the grocery store. But you can think about things that have a short shelf life and that maybe came a long way. So you can look at the product origin. So things like berries and asparagus are, are probably things that get shipped to Alaska by airplane. And then secondly, eating seasonally. So this is really important in Alaska where we have such a defined growing season. When we're in the thick of the summer and your greens and cucumbers are growing like gangbusters, eat up and enjoy them. But maybe even more importantly, if you can learn to preserve these foods by canning or freezing them, you can eat Alaska grown food year round. And if you didn't save any of your harvest for the winter and you find yourself relying um, on either food that was grown in Alaska in the winter using high energy inputs, maybe grown in a greenhouse or, or imported food, it might actually be a lower carbon footprint to eat food somewhere else. That said, there are tons of storage crops that are grown in Alaska that are sold year round, things like winter squash, potatoes, and carrots. And so we'll hear from a few speakers who'll tell you how to access these things. And then finally, before I turn it over to our panelists, I wanna revisit this question of eating local one more time. So we talked briefly about the nuances of eating local and how it affects your carbon footprint when you're living in Anchorage. And while obviously I'm a huge advocate for, for reducing your greenhouse gas emissions, I wanna argue that there's really a, a lot of other reasons why you might also wanna be eating local foods. So in ex for example, in addition to reducing your carb carbon footprint, Eating local can help you learn a new skill, whether that's growing or preserving your own, your own food or learning to harvest our wild foods in Alaska, meeting your neighbors. We have a great seed sharing program going on right now in Airport Heights, um, understanding how your food is produced, supporting the local economy when you're buying from our local farmers and fishermen, establishing traditions in your family, and of course, exploring our lovely state um, as you're making an effort to, to source your foods from Alaskan waters and soils. Okay, so with that, I am going to turn it over to our panelists. Um, each of our panelists will have four minutes to tell you more about the organizations they represent. So stay tuned so you can learn how to stay up to date with the latest information on Alaskan foods, find places to buy local Alaskan foods, get involved with organizations to help you um, grow your own fruits and veggies, learn more about foraging and hunting wild foods, running a food business, or staying informed about local state and federal policies that affect our food system here in Alaska. Um, Kari is going to start sharing her screen here. And first up, we have Amy, who's coming to tell us about um, Edible Alaska, which maybe you've seen at your favorite, uh, gosh, coffee shop, grocery store, restaurant, it's all over the place. Um, so I will turn it over to Amy. Oh, and I'll say, this will be the last you'll hear from me for an hour. The next bit is gonna be, again, the sort of rapid fire panelists, and they're gonna turn it over to each other one at a time um, and introduce themselves. So remember, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we will get to them after the whole slew of panelists have gone. Take it away, Amy. Hello. Hi, I'm Amy O'Neill Haug from Edible Alaska. And thank you, Micah, for putting on this panel and um, for uh, to the Alaska Common Brown for for organizing everything. Um, Micah, I don't see um, my own screen. I still see your screen as far as the speaker. I don't know if we want to do anything about that. Um, so I am co-publisher and co-editor of Edible Alaska magazine. And we are a quarterly publication, a print publication, which means it's a magazine that you can hold in your hand and um, flip through. Um, we're also obviously a media company. We have a website and you can find um, some of what we do online as well. Um, but we are a quarterly print 
publication and our mission is to tell the stories of food and drink in Alaska. Uh, we are advertiser and subscriber supported. You can find um, the magazine via distribution spots around the state and by becoming a subscriber. Uh, and um, if you wanna change to the next slide. Uh, this is a little bit of a uh, glimpse of our spring issue, um, which I don't know if you guys can see me as well, but I'm holding up a paper copy right here. Um, and uh, the theme of this issue is food justice and food sovereignty. And that sort of is adjacent to the, also the idea of food security, which I would offer these things as another reason um, to add to Micah's list of reasons to eat locally. Uh, and you can um, find some great articles uh, in this issue about food justice and food sovereignty, including from um, uh, one of our panelists here tonight, Robbie Mixon, uh, who is uh, not only a writer, but also part of the Alaska Farmers Market Association and Alaska Food Policy Council and the Alaska Food Hubs. So we have a variety of stories that we tell every issue, our summer issue, which is coming up. The theme is the green issue and we're taking that theme quite broadly, uh, green like summer and green like sustainability. So when you see that hit the stands in late May, please check it out. Uh, we are actively seeking stories and contributors statewide. We're always looking to grow both the breadth and depth of our storytelling and our storytellers. So if you are interested in telling your story of Alaska food, please feel free to reach out to me um, go ahead and change the slide, please. And um, you can find me on social media at Edible Alaska. You can email me, amy at edibleak.com. Uh, you can become a subscriber if you want to engage more with the magazine. You can sign up for our newsletter easily by just going to edibleAlaska.com. And of course, tell us what you think of the magazine. And that's about it for me. I look forward to hearing any questions you might have at the end. And I'm gonna pass this on to our next presenter, Arctic Harvest. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyla, and I'm the owner and operator of Arctic Harvest Deliveries based out of Anchorage. Um, there's a lot of different names for what we do. Um, we've been called a food hub or a middleman um, or an aggregator or distributor. Um, but essentially what we're trying to do is support local farmers and to help get their products to more people. So what that means is that we are only carrying um, and sourcing local products. So when you buy from us, you know that the product is grown, raised, harvested, or made in Alaska. Um, our main focus is on produce, but we also have a really great selection of uh, local meat and seafood, um, eggs, honey, really any farm products we can get our hands on. Um, we even have a lot of um, pantry items that are all sourced from uh, local businesses that are like-minded and that they're dedicated to using uh, as many local products as they can, often in creative ways like um, in chocolate or salsa or even granola. You can go to the next slide. So how do you get some of these local products that we have? Um, first, I want to make a shout out to local restaurants. We um, uh, the big part of what we do is wholesale. So we work with a lot of uh, restaurants around Anchorage and around the state. So we always like to kind of um, encourage people to ask your server about local items on the menu when you go out to eat. Um, restaurants have really big buying power. So they can really do a lot of, of good in purchasing local products for local farmers. And also please feel free to contact us if you do run a food business and are looking for products. We'd love to help you uh, with sourcing those. Um, and then you can also buy directly from us for like household use. So right now we have our um, online farm stand store um, going on. So um, it's, it's essentially like an online farmer's market. There's no subscription or any commitment required. You can order as often or as little as you like, whatever products you like. Um, essentially each week we list all the products we have available from our producers, uh, which tends to vary a little bit from week to week and throughout the season. We currently have things like potatoes, carrots, beets, turnips, hydroponic greens and herbs, um, some grains like couscous or barley products and uh, wheat. Um, and also we have a rotating selection of like our frozen proteins and a lot of different pantry items. Um, this is our main way of selling in the, in the off season. So we usually run it from like the fall through, through the whole winter and then into early spring. 
And that shop um, is open from 3 p.m. on Friday to 9 p.m. Sunday each week and is available on our website, which I will um, show you guys um, in the next slide here in a second. Um, so the, the last way that you can um, shop with us is through our summer farm shares. So as you can, um, as I'm sure you all know, summer is the height of the season for local produce. So that's when we switch to our uh, farm share model, which is, that's our subscription-based program. So that sets you up with regular boxes of, of local produce throughout the, throughout the summer. Um, it's all fully customizable. Um, and so when you sign up, you can choose your box size. You get to choose your delivery frequency, either weekly or every other week and your pickup location. Uh, we have lots of different public pickup locations throughout Anchorage, um, plus ones in Eagle River, Palmer, Wasilla, and Girdwood. And we're also off offering home delivery in Anchorage as well. So when you sign up with us for the farm share, you get to set your product preferences. Um, and then there's a customization window of a few days that you get to, that you have to be able to swap out your veggies. Um, you can add on other items like meat and seafood or chocolate or coffee or any of the other pantry items that we have available. Um, Signups for that open in two weeks, um, the first week of April, and you can check it out on our website. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. And so how do you get in touch? Uh, like I said, our website um, is one of the best ways to find more information. That's arcticharvestak.com. Um, there's also a sign up link there on our website for our newsletter, which you can join. Um, and then we're on Facebook and Instagram. So feel free to check us out there. Um, and then yeah, feel free to give us a call or email with any questions. Um, we love talking about local produce and local farmers, so we'd be happy to connect with you. That's about all I have, so we can uh, pass it on to the next presenter. Hi, I'm Robbie Mixon. Can you guys hear me? Hope so. You sound yes. good. Yes. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I am the local foods director for Cook Inlet Keeper. Um, we got our local foods program started about six years with the uh, creation of the Alaska Food Hub. Like Kyla said, we're, we're essentially an online farmer's market. We serve 100% local food. Um, most of that food is coming from our two main hubs in Homer and in Soldotna. We also have a um, trial that we're working with Alaska APU's Spring Hill Farm um, on doing a very small um, trial in Anchorage with the, the APU crew. Um, our main sites, like I said, are in Homer and Soldotna. We also um, fly products over to Seldovia and drive them up to Nanilchik as well. So um, let's go to the next slide. And here's a little explainer video on exactly uh, what the Food Hub is. The Alaska Food Hub is your online local foods connection, featuring 100% locally grown and harvested produce, seafood, and much more. The Food Hub is like a virtual farmer's market, and the process is both simple and easy. Each week, producers list items for sale on the online marketplace. Product availability changes weekly and with the season. Once the ordering cycle is open, Simply log on to the online marketplace and place items you'd like to buy in your cart. A confirmation email lets you know when and where to pick up your items. Return any time during the ordering cycle to add more items. Producers deliver all ordered products to a central location where items are sorted and inspected for quality. Customers then pick up their orders and the cycle begins again. The Alaska Food Hub. We make local easy. So like I said, most of our products come from Homer or Soldotna, but we also um, work with other local for food producers to bring extra value to our um, marketplace. So um, things like barnacle seafood or barnacle seaweed products, Chugach chocolate, that was mine on the favorite food list um, that we did earlier, and also some smoked salmon. Um, we can go to the next slide. And then finally, another program, um, I, I realized that uh, this was mostly Anchorage focused, so I wanted to throw in a plug for our other um, local food program at Cook and Lit Keeper. Um, they are, have been incubating the 
uh, relaunch of the Alaska Farmers Market Association. And we keep a uh, up-to-date database of all the markets across the state um, and including all the ones in Anchorage. So if you need more information about markets or eating locally, you can check us out at alaskafarmersmarkets.org. And I'll put a plug in for our upcoming free virtual conference that you guys all might uh, be interested in attending. And that's all for me. So we can go to our next presenter. Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> Robbie, really excited to hear about the Alaska Food Hub partnering with Spring Creek Farm. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, my name's Nick, and I'm really glad to be here with uh, so many of my Alaskan food heroes. Um, yeah, I'm here this evening to share a bit about Alaska Community Action on Toxics Organic Gardening Program, uh, Yardacopia. And so our motto there on the screen, growing food and, uh, and building community, kind of captures our bread and butter each summer, which is to pair up homeowners who donate yard space and tools with volunteers and gardeners who want to learn organic organic gardening techniques to uh, get access to gardening space. Maybe they're renters um, live in an apartment as well as just to meet your neighbors and to, to share the experience of, of growing food in Alaska. The, the produce we grow as part of the program is um, it's split between the gardener and the homeowner typically and the volunteers with 10% with going to charity. Um, and uh, we also like to focus a bunch of our gardening support and energy towards uh, clients of food pantries and other food insecure Alaskans um, and their families and, and folks without access to land uh, as well. So there's kind of an environmental health and environmental justice uh, aim as well with this program. The next slide shows uh, our garden building method, which, uh, We've been around for almost 10 years now. I think this might be our 10th summer coming up. And we, for the whole time, we've been really focusing on using a variety of free and kind of landfill bound organic materials. So leaves, grass, food scraps, manure, um, and piling those up into kind of that, you know, varieties of lasagna bed or sheet mulch beds. Um, keeping that stuff out of the Anchorage landfill and keeping the methane that that stuff would produce in the ground. So to make, make soil soil and healthy plant. Uh, it's, it's good fun as well. Um, and, and we don't have to use um, sides and other sorts of things. Um, so on the, on the last slide there, you can sign up and get involved. Oh, let's see, that's saying my internet connection is a little rough. Sorry, I'm on the road. But uh, on the last slide, you can sign up and get involved in the program by uh, one, offering yard space, tools, and other resources for new gardens and gardeners. You can also sign up as a gardener. And so you're looking for a place to grow plants and learn uh, new or organic techniques. And then people will often volunteer, uh, sign up as volunteers. So to help build, tend, and support other gardens, school gardens, community gardens, uh, and these backyard gardens all around town. So all the sign-up links and more info at, are at our website at yardacopia.org. And yeah, you can reach us at garden at akaction.org or even by phone. You can just give me a ring. Um, yeah, look forward to, to hearing from you guys. And on to our next speaker. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to represent Anchor Gardens um, in this big panel of experts tonight. My name is Cindy Carnes. And I co-founded this organization about a year ago with the pandemic on slot. And our mission is to make gardening resources and expertise accessible to everyone in the municipality, regardless of their income or their home ownership status, and to connect individuals and their skills into a giant network for the purpose of building social capital through gardening. There's a myth in Anchorage that we can't feed ourselves because we don't have the resources. Well, let me tell you what's true. We have lots of lawns. Those are wasted resources. We have paper products coming in, especially Amazon boxes. Oh my gosh. We have so many food scraps that are being wasted. 
We have uh, so many horses, goats, chickens, and rabbits in the municipality, and they produce a very important resource. We also have spent grain from the breweries and co used coffee that is just tossed out, and those are also very good for gardens. We also have an abundance of experts and all we need to do is connect them together so that they can learn from each other. So we're what we do then, we take those things and we build a lasagna garden. Um, some people call it sheet mulching and we sequester carbon and grow our food at the same time. Um, so how can you get started? First of all, the very most important thing is you need to take action, make a pledge to do something. Um, the smallest thing to the biggest thing. Join our network so that we can um, figure out how to connect you to people that know things you want to know or you can teach. We last summer had 30 out of the 36 uh, community council areas with a coach, with at least one coach. Uh, this year, I hope to have at least three in every community council area. Use crowdsourcing. We put together a Facebook um, page for each community council area because gardening in um, Chugiak, Chugiak is not the same as gardening downtown. So you can use people in your neighborhood or address the whole community. There's also a, a larger Anchor Gardens page. And lastly, share everything that you have. If you have extra hoses, extra whatever, uh, if you have an abundance, share it with others. So what happens then if you have done all that or you want to do more, there's other things that you can do to connect with us. And you can save your leaves and grass clippings and bring them down. We also need different places to store these if people want to bring them down. We only have two drop sites right now. We could use some more. Um, you, If you have a truck, you could go get some spent grain or coffee grounds for us. That would be great. Here's our demonstration garden. Somebody donated a, a lot of land uh, next to City Market downtown, and um, we're putting at least 10 gardeners there, maybe more. This is Teresa Brown, our farm manager there. And here's them building the garden, getting food scraps from City Market, which was awesome. And there's the final product. So the thing is, it's all hands on deck right now. If you know something, teach someone. We need you to be a coach. Please sign up if you're interested at all. If you'd like to donate or do something else for Anchor Gardens or you have another idea, please contact us. Check us out at anchorgardens.org. Um, there's a donate button there if you just want to donate cash. It's been great. I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you so much. Good evening. And now on to our Good next evening. speaker. Mark, we can't hear you actually. It looks like you're off mute, but maybe your microphone. Nope. Give him one second. It looks like maybe he just uh, ref is refreshing. This is actually kind of nice. It gives you a quick reprieve. Run to the bathroom, grab a beer, get a snack. Mark will be back with us in just a minute. I'm also seeing some questions coming in on the chat. I'm, I'm already really excited about the Q&A section of the evening. So keep throwing your questions there. Um, our lovely Anchorage librarian is documenting all of them very well. And then we will um, be able to address them to all of the panelists when, uh, when we get to that section. If you wanna address someone in particular, make sure and put their name on there, who you wanna address it to, Kyla, Amy, whoever, whichever speaker. Um, otherwise, it'll just be a generic question that we'll throw out to the panel. Micah, do you think we should go on to the next one and then come back to Mark? Sure. Yeah, that sounds that great. Hi, 
my name is Laurie Irwin, and I'm going to talk to you about Space Farming Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that teaches students of all ages how astronauts are growing food in space. Our mission is to train the agronauts of tomorrow while solving childhood hunger today. So much in common with NASA's deep space exploration, from our complicated accessibility issues to our art climate with long months of cold and darkness, we are uniquely qualified to understand what our new lunar and Martian colonies will need to thrive. Space Farming Institute is at the intersection of climate challenges, sustainable agriculture, emerging green technologies, biofuels, and space exploration. We teach sustainability and food sufficiency. We're also developing new technology and research to be able to grow unlimited amounts of fresh food in Alaska. Next slide, please. It's really an exhilarating time for this new frontier. Our voyage of discovery is just beginning. Agriculture is the world's largest industry. It employs more than 1 billion people and generates over $1.3 trillion worth of food annually. According to the Alaska Food Policy Council's research, we could quickly generate a $5 billion food industry in Alaska just by eating local. This nexus of sustainable food systems and biofuels will forever change what foods we eat along with where and how we grow food for every community, large and small. Our nonprofit is developing new techniques to grow the most nutritious food and turn the green collar jobs needed for the new urban agriculture industry. Our students experience green technologies firsthand from using leaf sensors developed for NASA that literally text us when a plant is thirsty to robotic systems that plant our seeds for us and die plant growth, just like astronauts are going to use on Mars in the next 10 years. Our engineering projects practice growing food in 3D space from floor to ceiling. It grows systems that use 90% less water than soil farms and eliminates nutrient runoff with no harmful impacts to the environment. Food is nutrient rich and most of all, it has an extraordinary flavor. How can you get involved? Next slide, please. Take a class. You can learn to grow a variety of fresh food. Join us for one of our many research projects. We're inventing new hydroponic systems and robotic components. Sponsor an agronaut or sponsor a tower garden workshop. Donate money for robotics, hydroponic equipment, or donate to feed a child in need. You can find us on the web at www.agronautsplural.org. Like or share our Facebook post on Space Farming Institute with your family and friends. By leading space farming programs to train the agronauts of tomorrow, we hope to help our children succeed, our communities thrive, and our nation reach for the stars. To Mark. Well, hello. Is my, is my audio working now? You sound great. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Sometimes uh, Zoom just doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, my name is Mark Walvers. I'm president of the Alaska Pioneer Fruit Growers Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping those interested in growing fruit. Uh, our statewide membership receives monthly newsletters. They participate in winter programs attend grafting, pruning, and top working workshops to learn how to care for trees, uh, participate in orchard tours, apple pressings, and fruit tastings, really all with the purpose of just helping people enjoy and grow great fruit in Alaska. Uh, every year, the Alaska Pioneer Fruit Growers Association imports over 1,000 fruit tree rootstock for people to graft and plant. If you see a fruit tree in Alaska, odds are pretty good uh, that it has a connection to our club. Can I have a next slide, please? Uh, the photos in my slides were fruit grown in our yard in East Anchorage. Uh, last year, our 11,000 square foot lot produced 300 pounds of apples, 160 pounds of cherries, in addition to a multitude of other various berries and vegetables. 
Um, in the past, you know, every pioneer farm, uh, farm family uh, had fruit and apple trees for sustenance. Uh, fresh fruit, canned fruit, sauce, juice, dried fruit, and even hard cider were food staples that pioneer families depended upon for nutrition throughout the year. Fruit trees delivered back then and, and they can sustain us today as well. When we plant fruit trees and bushes, the food produced displaces plastic packaging. It displaces chemicals and fertilizer used in large scale agriculture. Uh, it displaces transportation and refrigeration. It connects us back to the land, but, but most importantly, it's nutritious and it tastes amazing. Can I have the next slide, please? Fruit trees and bushes are investments that provide food year after year with little effort in Alaska. It's easy to grow organically here as Alaska is relatively free of the pests and disease found in the lower 48. There's a popular Chinese proverb that states, quote, the best time to plant an apple tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And what that means is that if you wish to have success and sustenance in the future, the best time to act is today. Consider the impact if more people planted fruit trees and bushes, or better yet, if you bought a house and it already had productive trees. This could have a positive effect on Alaska's food security and help support efforts to limit climate change. Local action can have global consequences. The trees and plants in our small lot will continue to sustain generations of Alaskans long after we're gone. In closing, I would just encourage you to join Alaska Pioneer Fruit Growers Association, and we'll show you how to grow fruit now and for the future. Thank you, and on to our next presenter. Thank you, Mark. This is Shelley Routon with the Municipality of Anchorage. Um, I manage one of our most exciting um, properties, the former Native Service Hospital site at 3rd and Ingra. Um, many of you know the history of that site. Um, we took it over in 1998 when it was demolished. And uh, through the years, the, um, the elders have approached many mayors and um, had wishes for what we would do with the property. Um, so a couple years ago, the planning process was undertaken to develop the site, to, to vision the site. Um, and what came out of that and several other processes like our local foods, local places, um, visit and report and um, some testing, some soil testing with EPA and Embry grants. Um, we began to formulate a vision and uh, this one here is, is a bit of an unofficial vision, but it summarizes what's on the next slide. If you can move to that. Um, we, we now are to a point that we can begin to activate this vision. And so part of, of the master planning process identified a large area that was um, named urban agriculture and solar um, farming. So I took this site and I actually collaborated with someone who's on this call right now, Una Martin, um, and this is her work. Um, and, and we created a concept for the farm, um, much to just have a spatial reference. So you can see here, we, we put in six greenhouses, some container gardens. Um, we actually have a grant, uh, the Alaska Food Policy Council has a grant for a rised orchard that will go in the summer. Um, and we really started working with a lot of groups. Again, Food Policy Council, Alaska Behavioral Health, Seeds of Change, the Alaska Conservation Foundation, Fresh, uh, ANTHC, the museum, um, ACLT, and, and numerous others. Uh, Alaskans Take a Stand, Anchorage Downtown Partnership. So we've begun to pick apart each of these, these items and really, dive in and, and see how we can make this more than just, um, a, you know, a, a community garden where people can rent spaces. So we've really moved to a job training, a vocational training um, vision where we also will use it for therapy and education and experimental uses and demonstration. Um, 
And, and I think what we're really moving towards, and, and I don't know that any of us have verbalized this yet, but I think that we're really trying to normalize socialization around food and sustainable practices. Um, you can see on this drawing, we have, we have some, some uh, food uh, trailers at the front and uh, food business incubators and walking areas and public art and, and all kinds of things. So we're really looking for collaborators. Um, like I said, we, we really want it to be um, focused with job training and social services um, that put uh, sustainability and farming in the forefront of, of our minds and, and careers and, and daily life. So thank you. Oh, there's a next slide, sorry. <laughs> it kind of summarizes everything I just said. I'm sorry, I will pass it on to the next presenter. Hello, everyone. Avanga etika katalinya. Inipe no ronga, ani ronga kiki tagrume, sabaktunga a and thc me, nilogmi chisiga Jackie Schaefer. I work as a project manager for uh, the ANTHC uh, Division of Environmental Health and Engineering. I am an avid harvester, gatherer, um, gardener, environmentalist, knowledge bearer, and land steward. And um, this has just been fabulous. I can't even tell you how excited I am to see everybody come together. Um, but something that isn't brought to uh, folks' attention when they move to our state is that our land base is 65% federal ownership. So the ability to harvest nature's blessings is out there. The 25% is also state. So you could harvest on state and federal land. Um, and there's so many maps online um, to access the correct land base. Um, if you're going on traditional lands, um, have the courtesy and respect to ask those tribes if you may harvest. Um, I have yet to have anyone tell me no. Um, I think it's, it's something that um, this to me bridges the gap of um, natural harvesting and agriculture. So you can't grow, I guess you can grow everything you wanna eat, but if you want a, a, a larger variety of um, natural resources from the land, air and sea, you could combine those with gardens and um, create a food system that um, doesn't need very much of anything else. And so um, I wanna go on to the next slide. Um, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, our vision is that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. But if you live in Alaska, you have the ability to harvest and preserve um, so many natural foods. Um, and then on top of that, you have the ability to grow additional things. So, um, you know, the blessings we have there are just incredible. And I think something we forget about, especially in this year of COVID, I was so excited to see that that was one initiative that somebody had was in response to being isolated. Uh, how could we, um, you know, manage waste differently and how could we become sustainable and have this food system that's so healthy and natural? Um, something we forget about is the human connection to plants. Uh, we are living organisms and when we pick berries or harvest our uh, vegetables and fruits, we have the ability to interact with uh, an energy that most people don't um, do um, anywhere else. So even if you grow your food, um, get out on the land because the, the land provides something that um, you can't just walk out um, on the street in New York City or even Seattle and harvest from the land. So what we have available to us is, is really incredible. So what it does is it changes your psychology. It gives you physical exercise. It also enhances your um, endorphins so that you become happier because you have this wonderful energy that's feeding um, your you know, psychology and your, so overall just everything is, um, 
it's a holistic way of healing. And after being isolated, you get to go out and forage and harvest and grow. And to me, that is something that um, programs that have been shared here, and I'm gonna ask you to go on to the next slide, and programs that we have at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium help you learn more about the environment you live in. And so this um, holistic way of looking at uh, our, our planet and our environment that we share space with right now, plants and trees and animals, whoops, gives us a um, very unique um, perspective. So we have a few programs at the Native um, Health Consortium. Uh, store Outside Your Door is one. And I'll put the link to um, the videos on YouTube. We have a YouTube page that shares recipes and harvesting practices. Um, we also have traditional gardens on our campus at the Alaska Native Medical Center. And um, during normal times, we give tours and introduce these plants to people. And you know, I think we're getting back to that space. So keep that in mind as um, we move forward towards the fall season when everything's in full bloom. Um, certainly reach out and ask for a tour of the campus. Um, we also have um, the Food and Medicine Symposium, the Alaska Plants is Food and Medicine Symposium. Um, we forget that medicine is derived from nature. And sometimes it's hard to, to think that um, living organisms, viruses and bacteria are also living in nature. And some of them make us sick, but there are plants that could help us heal um, from those ailments. So um, I just encourage you to learn more and uh, reach out to um, the programs that are available to you and um, integrate uh, natural food resources with agriculture because uh, we have it available to us. And we, the more we share, um, the more we learn, uh, the healthier we'll be. So thank you. And I'm gonna pass it on to our next presenter. Hi there, I am Caitlin Zonival and I am the South Central Coordinator for the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program. The BOW program runs nationwide and was founded to help women become more confident by offering classes to learn about outdoor skills and natural resources in an encouraging and supportive non-competitive learning environment. The BOW program in Alaska is run through the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and it provides hands-on workshops and classes to teach adults beginner outdoor skills based on the resources and activities available to us in Alaska. No experience is necessary and BOW Alaska is for adults of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. While BOW is targeted at women, men are welcome to participate as well. We hope that women leave BOW with newfound skills to utilize Alaska's local resources through hunting, fishing, and gathering. Next slide, please. Every year we offer a minimum of three BOW workshops that are held in Anchorage during the winter, Fairbanks during the summer, and Southeast Alaska during the springtime. The workshops span a weekend beginning at noon on Friday and ending around 2 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. Participants choose from a variety of classes, such as hunting, field dressing, meat butchering, fishing, Dutch oven cooking, Alaska seafood, archery, pond to pan cooking, cross country skiing, firearm safety, canning and smoking fish, foraging local wild edible plants, outdoor survival, map and compass, and many, many more. Our workshop mission is to connect women with Alaska natural resources available to them. And we hope they can learn to provide for themselves and their families and friends with local meat and plants, as well as connect with nature through various activities. Uh, participants, uh, participants are encouraged to enjoy the local side the social side that comes with outdoor activities as well and make connections with like-minded individuals whom are able to enjoy these activities and these newfound skills within the future after the workshop. So they're able to leave with something that they've learned and people that they can uh, count on in the future. We also offer small classes, which are topic specific courses targeted towards building on beginner skills, teaching more advanced skills and maybe it conducted um, mostly in an outdoor setting. BOW classes also focus on a skill that takes more time to teach than is available in our traditional workshops, um, such as knife making, rod building, saltwater fishing, small and large game hunting, and so on. BOW classes may take place in an afternoon over a weekend or several evenings. Next slide, please. 
Um, so the best way that you guys can get involved with the BOW program is participating in our classes and workshops. Our classes are listed on our website um, for the entire year, and we add more as we them. Um, registration opens three to four weeks prior to class dates, and all classes are for beginners, but some may have prerequisites in order to participate. Um, you can also apply and to become an instructor to help out the BOW program. If you're an expert on a certain subject or really love teaching about the outdoors or something in particular, you can contact us to receive an instructor application. Um, we're always looking for new people who love teaching and love um, sharing more about the outdoors and how to be involved in hunting, fishing, and gathering. Um, and lastly, follow us on Facebook. Our Becoming an Outdoors Woman Alaska page is our, uh, our biggest uh, posting center. We use post all of our classes, events, and information regularly on there so you can keep up to date on what we have going on. Uh, we hope to see you in our classes to learn about something new. And thank you guys for having us to spotlight us for a second and on to our next presenter. Hi there, everybody. I am Jason Croft, the founder of the Alaska Hunting Collective. I just want to say what a thrill it is to be here. Um, uh, I love it that hunting has a seat at the table for um, a conversation involving sustainable local foods. Um, for me, hunting has always been about food resource above all else. I've got some contact information up here on the screen. I'll get to this again on the last slide. I do not yet have a website, but the uh, email address you see there, alaskahuntingcollective at gmail.com, is probably the best way to get a hold of me. So I have a rhetorical question here for the group. You can maybe answer it um, at your own leisure in the chat box. What is hunting good for? Um, I have my hand raised, I'm gonna answer that question. I believe hunting is an act of conservation at its most basic form. You're taking part in conservation when you are hunting. Hunters have a huge positive impact on both land and wildlife health. Talking about um, hunting licenses, <clears throat> firearm sales, ammunition sales, and now a growing number of outdoor gear companies funnel money into conservation efforts across the country, including here in Alaska, to improve land and wildlife health. Um, I also believe that hunting is an act of self-care. It builds confidence and a connection to the natural world that I have not found in anything else I've ever done. Um, so it's one of the main reasons I like to promote people getting into the hunting lifestyle. It's a really good way to build confidence in yourself in the outdoors. And finally, I believe hunting is an act of love for food, for wild food, for local food, because hunting is the original local vor experience. Next slide, please. So this isn't just about me and the Alaska Hunting Collective. I'm gonna step off my soapbox for just a moment because I wanna talk a little bit about two incredible organizations that I volunteer with um, that really complement the work that I do as a hunting mentor. The First Hunt Foundation um, is dedicated to keeping the hunting tradition relevant and alive in modern America. Um, they focus primarily on youth, getting kids involved in hunting so that kids too can learn where their food comes from. Um, there's a lot of reciprocal benefits from getting kids outdoors more and learning where their food comes from. Um, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, I volunteer with them as well. They have an Alaska chapter up here and they are by far and away the best advocates for conservation minded hunters. Um, they also do an incredible amount of work for protecting our public lands, federal and state lands that are set aside for all tax paying citizens of the United States to use for free um, without development. They, they do a lot of work to make sure that those lands stay wild and stay free and that we all have equal access opportunities um, to those public lands. They also do a lot with field to table, so butchering workshops, cooking classes, and they have a great hunting for sustainability program. So with anyone that I mentor, I encourage them to sign up and become a member of BHA, $35 a year. And it's really kind of putting, it's voting with your dollars as a hunter as I like to say. So next slide, please. 
So what do I do as a hunting mentor? Well, I tend to work one-on-one -on -one with folks. I help new hunters overcome the intimidation factor. Um, I went through it myself. Alaska is a big place. Hunting up here is fairly complex and a lot of people hit a wall. They get overwhelmed quickly. So what I do is I meet people where they're at. I don't, I don't get to work with a lot of folks, but I do enjoy getting them into the field and watching them grow. Um, how can you get involved? You can contact me. Probably again, the best way is my email address down there at the bottom of the screen. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to hear me out tonight. I'm gonna pass it over to my, uh, the next presenter, Tegan Galbraith from the Internet Intertribal Agricultural Council. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tikan Galbra, the Intertribal Agriculture Council. I'm super stoked to be here. I'm grateful for everything that has been shared so far. Um, so for a century, we've been drawing on the bank of soil fertility that was created, that was created the, by the diversity that exists in nature and the stewardship of indigenous peoples. We're being shown by the rapid increase of climate change that we are approaching the end of those reserves. Yet, I recently stumbled across this quote from Eula Biss, where she said, the garden in which we work when we are no longer optimistic is not a retreat from the world, but a place where we cultivate the world. This idea gives me hope, and it is a sentiment that I, as well as the organization that I work for, have been working on for decades. There is possibility for reform, opportunity to recreate and develop a just and equitable system that invests in human lives and all the relationships that we keep. Relations to our community, to the land, to the animals, and with ourselves. At the foundation of these relationships, food is a catalyst for health. Intertribal Agriculture Council recognizes the interconnectedness of this challenge. And as a result, we as a tribal nonprofit invest our time and our energy in a diverse array of services and programs, as you can see on the slide in front of you. Next slide, please. Part of IAC's work is the program that my position is funded under, a National Technical Assistance Network. We have a technical assistance specialist in each of the BIA, Borough of Indian Affairs regions to support tribes and tribal producers accomplish their goals related to food sovereignty. Within this work, we offer free technical assistance and meet our clients wherever they are at and work to remove barriers, identify solutions, and support their individual or community visions. Next slide, please. It is important to reconcile with the fact that there is no going back, only forward. Fortunately, Alaska has a unique position. In many cases, infrastructure has yet to be built. In doing so, we can start to imagine a future we want to see rather than limit ourselves to how to change what exists already. Through small scale community focused efforts in partnership with support from statewide efforts, we have the opportunity to develop a resilient and robust food system that not only feeds us, but also brings us closer together and reduces our contributions to global carbon footprint. Indigenous communities manage vast amount of land and resources throughout the world. While unwelcomed government and private industry interventions have significantly reduced the native homelands in the United States, 59 million acres remain under native management. A vast majority of those resources are utilized for food and agricultural purposes. In Alaska, collectively, Alaska Native people are the largest private landholders in the state. In most cases, that land was selected by individuals, tribes, and Alaska Native corporations and chosen based on the traditional uses and the availability of food resources. In my work, I've not had a single conversation with any individual or tribe who does not value the ability to continue practicing our traditional ways of life while also ensuring the food security for their community. What does that look like? It is annual fish harvests from the rivers and oceans that provide for us. It is gallons and gallons of berries put up and preserved for the winter is caribou hunts, moose hunts, whale hunts, it is community gardens and greenhouses. It is the revitalization of traditional use areas. It is sharing of our resources and bounty to ensure that no one goes hungry. By activating and empowering native, holistic, regenerative ways of producing food and agricultural products, we can inspire and inform a worldwide movement 
that will make a significant impact on climate mitigation for the benefit of all. And so I ask you all this, if Alaskan food related products, activities and ways of life disappeared from our state, would you still wanna live here? If no berries were to be found while walking through the sweet and spicy smell of tundra, if your garden harvest didn't blow, grow beyond belief under the long summer sun, if your hands never held the sparkling scale of salmon you were thanking for its life, would you still feel like this was home? If the answer is no, then I really encourage all of you to find a way to engage in your own life in even more of Alaska's diverse and unique food system to make it more resilient and more inclusive. So again, my name is Tikon. I'm with the Intertribal Agriculture Council. I'll put my contact in the chat. I didn't put it on this slide. Um, and you can learn more about the organization at indianag.org. I really appreciate the time to just share some of this perspective. You know, Alaska Native people um, have a big role to play in the future of Alaska as they have had a long standing role in its preservation and its continued success. Thank you. Thanks, Tikan. I'm Sarah Lewis, the Family and Community Development Agent for the UAF Cooperative Extension in Southeast. And I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for including me. I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Tlingit people, whom we thank for their stewardship, Gunalchish. The UAF Extension has been an important part of food security throughout Alaska for more than 100 years, as basically the community education arm of Alaska's land grant university in Fairbanks. This slide shows um, eight of the general program areas in which we teach classes throughout Alaska. We have a focus on hands on skill building and research based information. So agriculture and climate change, uh, we have research at the agriculture and forestry experiment station, uh, the Fairbanks and Matsu experiment farms test crop varieties. We are very involved with youth development in all of the extension program areas. A lot of people are familiar with the flagship organization uh, program of 4-H, that's throughout Alaska. We are involved in nutrition education throughout the state with educators in Fairbanks, Toke, Anchorage, Palmer, Bethel, and in Juneau who help youth and adults learn about healthy eating habits. We also have diabetes prevention programs and chronic disease management programs throughout the state. We offer, we're part of the produce safety team throughout Alaska with the Department of Environmental Conservation. And we've helped train more than 100 farmers on new federal produce safety regulations. We're involved with food entrepreneurship uh, through helping people start cottage foods businesses and then partnering with other business development or agencies throughout the state to help small businesses scale up. We also offer certified food protection manager classes and uh, exam proctoring throughout the state for folks who run commercial kitchens. And then food preservation and preparation, which is one of my main areas through the health, home and family development program. We have agents throughout the state who teach classes in safe home food preservation from making pickles and berry products to pressure canning foods for long term storage and uh, maintaining control over your ingredients, as well as teaching classes about home resource use, including uh, food waste, reducing food waste and using local and wild food resources. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that shows all of our office, 10 office locations throughout the state and lists of uh, many of, but not all of the communities in which we've taught over just the last few years. We have extension agents and staff distributed throughout the state living and teaching within our own regions. So, um, and we have an outreach office in Anchorage and a larger office in Palmer. 
Faculty and staff teach classes in both of those locations, but faculty and staff from all the other offices also offer online classes and conferences and class series that can be joined from anywhere in the state and actually anywhere in the world, which folks do, which is wonderful. Next slide, please. So this is a small sample of classes currently on our calendar for the next month or so. So you can see that we have classes in agriculture focused topics like produce safety, agribility for including people of different abilities in agriculture, greenhouse, pesticide and soil technologies, home gardening skills, personal health promotion and diabetes prevention, food entrepreneurship and food safety and safe home food preservation. So um, we have been promoting uh, through the Cooperative Extension Alaska's food security for the last 100 years. We hope we will be doing so for the next 100 years. And we hope to see you all in our classes. And thank you for including us on this panel. So thank you. And now our next presenter is from Ag Alaska, Alaska Village uh, Initiatives. Thanks so much, Sarah. And Ronalda, I don't see you in the list of participants, but I don't want to skip over you. So I just want to give a little shout out and just speak up if you are in fact here. And if not, we will just move on to our final speaker, Rachel Miller, to talk about the Alaska Food Policy Council. Good evening, everyone. Ronalda, feel free to jump in. We can. <laughs> We can tag team this if you show up. Um, can you hear me okay, Micah? You sound great. Okay, thanks. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for making it through. This was the fastest um, panel of 15 organizations I've been in. So well done to the organizers and thanks to Alaska Common Ground for hosting us. Um, I'm Rachel Miller. I chair the Alaska Food Policy Council and the Alaska Food Policy Council connects, informs and advocates for a more robust and resilient food system across the state of Alaska. Um, I hope that everyone has heard the message tonight that there are a lot of different ways to engage in your food system um, and your motivation, you know, your motivations can vary. Um, I think it's really exciting to know that we are all consumers. Food is the common bond that ties us all. And um, I was really inspired by all of the projects tonight and I kind of want to go start an orchard in my backyard. So we just really appreciate all of the potential collaborators and partners we have in the room tonight. So the Alaska Food Policy Council is a 15 volunteer member statewide board. We have a part-time executive director. You heard Robbie Mixon speak earlier this evening. She uh, made the switch from our governing board to our first ever executive director this year and it's been a game changer for us. Um, we also have a robust network of volunteers, which is especially apparent during the time of our conference, which happens every 18 months. And we are so grateful for our community because there is no way we could run the conference that we do without our volunteers. We work with everybody who is interested. We, our big goal is to make sure that folks feel empowered to make their own decisions in their food system. You can call that food sovereignty, you can call that food security, but we believe that communities should be leading the, leading the charge for themselves on how to create a more robust food system. And so things that we do, we are partnering with a couple different groups right now to offer simply things like access to a Zoom platform. Um, if you need a better way to collaborate, you need some technology, we assist organizations and individuals who want to have food related conversations. Um, and we want to hear from all of you. And so if you do have a project that you're excited about and you want to talk more about food systems, we invite you to reach out. Um, next slide, please. Some of the things that we do, you may have heard about. Some are fairly new. We have, um, let's see, this is a really, this is a full slide. We have, if you go to our webpage, um, which Robbie Mixon has just chatted in the chat, you can see two pretty key reports as well as a variety of other published resources on food systems. These two reports you see on the right hand side of the screen, and they have a lot of background information on the state of our food system in Alaska. As I said, we run a conference every 18 months all over the state this year in, I'm sorry, next year in 2022, it will be in Anchorage. So if you wanna help be a part of that, 
reach out. We would love more, more hands and voices in that initiative. And we generally see at least a couple hundred people at these conferences. Uh, we published our first annual report recently. So if you're still confused or not quite sure what we do, it is on our website in our annual report. This year as well, we are creating a discussion series that came from our, our conference last November. Folks wanted to have more touch points, have more discussion around food throughout the year. So we're running a discussion series this year on um, food supply chain, um, transportation, cold storage, things like that. So check us out on Facebook for those upcoming events. We participate in Food Security Week every year with the Alaska Food Coalition, the Food Bank of Alaska, and many other partners. We really appreciate the power of partnership and collaboration. My timer's gonna go off here, so I'm just gonna turn that off. Um, and the biggest thing that we're working on right now is our USDA, a recently awarded USDA grant for uh, a regional food systems partnership project where we are working with 13 communities across the state to determine what their current food system assets are, what can help them grow their own food, store more food, be more food secure. And um, that will, all that information in the next year and a half will roll up into a 10 year food security report for the state of Alaska. Next slide, please. And there's my harmonica. If you wanna get more involved, if you are excited about what you heard tonight, um, A, I encourage you to reach out to all the groups tonight. Um, what a fantastic group of people. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. All of this is on our website. Uh, we encourage people to become members. We do have a free membership and um, there are a variety of working groups and committees that you can join as well. And if you have an idea for your own, you are welcome to propose it. So thank you for the time tonight. Thank you for sticking around for the whole presentation. Um, happy to be here. Oh my gosh. All right, before we move forward, let's give our panelists a round of applause, thumbs up, however you wanna like Zoom, Zoom give accolades. That was amazing. Um, both for the content and for staying on time. We had so much to get through. So thank you everybody so much um, for yeah, really preparing well. Okay, so with our last 10 minutes, we have some Q and A. Um, our, the AK Common Ground folks have been diligently uh, noting all of your questions um, and I have a list to go through. There's also been a really robust conversation in the chat and some and resources have been going up um, as we have been talking. So hopefully you've been paying attention there. Um, but let's turn uh, to our uh, to our panelists. Okay, so I have a softball question first for Cindy to get warmed up. Um, people wanted to know, should they save even the small Amazon boxes? And where are the drop sites that people should take donated products like cardboard boxes? Um, and maybe also do you have instructions for I noted in the chat, taking off some tape or how, how should people prepare their donations for you? Yep, flat boxes only. Um, right now, the, the only address I not, know off the top of my head is uh, the I Street Garden. There's, um, you'll see it right next to City Market there. You just pull in and you can drop things off there. There's another one, but that'll be on our website. I can't think of it. Perfect. Okay, um, this one, uh, Actually, I'll let anyone that wants to, one of the panelists that want to take this one. Someone says, I would like to create a garden in the back of my apartment building. Do you have suggestions for how I could approach my landlord? I love this question. So I want to see if anyone has any, um, any tips or tricks. What, how, what, how could you convince a, convince a landlord um, to let you grow on their property? And I'm sorry if one of the panelists are raising your hand and I can't see you. Let's see. Any panelists have some ideas? I was thinking of um, a, maybe a similar approach to a lot of people talked about harvesting on people's land. Um, and it's maybe a similar, a similar idea. Um, how do you can how do you convince people to let you harvest on their private property or grow on their property? Micah, this is Jason. Um, hey, Jason. Well, in the Midwest, when you're hunting on someone's land, that's where I grew up, um, you would typically share your harvest just um, if you were doing a turkey hunt or a white-tailed deer hunt and you were accessing someone's private land, it just goes without saying that you would share that harvest. So I think the same would apply 
yeah. with a situation like this, you would probably approach the landlord and say, um, let's make a deal for a 50% split of the harvest, something like that. That, that would convince me <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. Nicola with a yard of copia. I think Nick might be off the phone, but that's how they their whole program is structured. If people grow in their backyard, the homeowner gets part of that harvest. So I, I, I would suspect that has gone well. And maybe you could talk to him about um, the language they use for that. Um, Shelly, one of our panelists actually asked a great question. So she's the, the Brownfields director for the Muni. And she said, she always wonders what kind of soil testing is performed, if any, for community-based gardening sites, or are they placed atop impermeable barriers? Um, that might be a good one actually for you, Cindy, if you have some thoughts on that. Oh, and you're on mute. Okay, there I am. Uh, yeah, uh, that's been a, a huge thing uh, that we've had to deal with. And our idea is that um, if you build the, the, the garden up, you have less likelihood of um, getting into those contaminants, but there's contaminants all over Anchorage. I'm thinking right now of the Third Avenue um, garden that there's old um, residue from an old dry cleaner down there. So yeah, all those things have to be taken care of. Raised beds are definitely the way to go. Yeah, no, that's a great advice. Um, this one is for Lori. So I wanted to know if you offer any classes online, um, for basically mostly to reach other communities in Alaska that may not be located um, here on the road system. Uh, yes, we do. In May, we're going to have some online Zoom classes that will be available to anyone in Alaska who has uh, internet access, just need to register. Uh, we've made those classes available for families to be able to participate. So if grandma wants to garden with their uh, grandkid during the class, welcome to do it. Happy to teach more people about hydroponics and robotics, and space exploration, and all of that. Looking forward to meeting you. Um, oh, whoever's not on mute, if you can mute, that would be great. Um, Jackie, folks wanted to know if the ANTHC resources are open to non-native Alaskans. Oh, she's still here, Jackie. I'm, okay, I'm here. Um, could you ask me that again? Sorry, I yeah, was trying to did. figure out how to unmute. Oh, no worries. People just wanted to know if the ANTHC resources that you mentioned, like store outside your door and the other um, food resources are open to non-native Alaskans. So the, yes, uh, the actual YouTube um, page is open to anybody. So you can learn from the, the resources that are provided. Um, the symposium, yes, um, they haven't had one due to COVID, but um, they do, um, have regional um, symposiums and yes, you, you could uh, attend. Also um, the South Central Foundation has the Tikatnu plant um, symposium. That one fills up super fast. So um, you just have to look out for them. Um, but the resources, yeah, you could certainly, um, most everything is online under the program link. So if you go to ANTHC, under ANTHC, you could go to what we do and then go to that particular program. Awesome, thanks, Jackie. Um, I see we are getting close, but I'm gonna, we have a couple more questions that I wanna throw out there. Um, this one was for Sarah. Someone wanted to know, is anyone documenting or educating small share farmers around topics like agricultural adaptation and mitigation practices? So things like new pests and diseases, integrated pest management or season extension. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, but what I can do, uh, because I'm not in the agriculture side of our programming, but I can definitely get a hold of our experiment farms and find out what kind of information they have. I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat for this person and I can get an answer for them. And also actually a follow-up, is there a, an extension office in Anchorage? And if so, where is it? 
There is, and actually farther down in the chat, Deshanna York, who um, who runs that office, put uh, the address for it. There's a new office um, that's on International Airport Road, and she has the phone number there. And as soon as we're once again open to the public, go and visit. Um, great. Um, this one actually has come up with within the Alaska Common Ground Board, and so I want to I'll throw it out there in case anyone has any information to offer. Um, does anyone have any examples of farmers or backyard gardeners practicing no-till for generative farming in Alaska? It seems like I would think lasagna and sheep mulching would sort of fall into this category, um, but I don't know if there are other examples that folks have or want to throw out or, or maybe provide some more information about where people could learn more about that, um, that type of farming. I think Allie Barker's farm at Chugach, Chugach Farms is probably the best example of, of that happening in all of South Central. She's doing an excellent job. And I think she has free weeding Tuesdays or something. You can go out and check it out and weed for that's her. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, no, that's a nice, uh, that seems like a win-win. You get, she gets weeding, you get to learn. Um, this one, someone might need to speak up. I think this, this question just came in. I'm on lower hillside and considering sharing my garden as a result of this presentation. I'm not sure what they mean by sharing, but their, their question is, what would I need to do for moose and bear control? Which I think is a great question for anyone trying to grow food in Alaska. Um, maybe I'll throw this one to Mark um, because this is something we talk about with our fruit trees all the time. Uh, if you have some suggestions about what people need to do to keep their baby fruits safe from animals. Sure, uh, at least a six foot high fence. <laughs> uh, you know, the funny thing is, is that uh, some of the uh, growers uh, down in South Anchorage uh, some of the larger uh, apple growers have actually had trouble with bears. So it's not been just moose, it's actually been bear intrusions. Um, but for critters, uh, if you're growing things like a garden or even fruit trees, you need to have uh, protection starting at the bottom um, for small animals because rabbits will get in, will eat uh, the lower levels of your plants. And then you need uh, higher fencing to keep out larger uh, like moose and that sort of thing. So, Micah, if I could add to yeah, that, definitely. I think that a lot of us, when we hear fencing, we're like, oh, that's expensive. Um, this year is too late, but do be paying attention in future years to the D Alaska Division of Agriculture. They received funding from the Farm Bill that Senator Murkowski's office worked hard to get in to get funding allocated for Alaska, Hawaii, and territories. Um, this year's application process was very, it was a very tight turnaround. But again, if you're looking for fencing in the future, mm -hmm. I encourage you to reach out to the Division of Agriculture and they will have, they're called micro grant programs. That's great. Yeah, that, that's a great resource to, to be aware of. Thanks, Rachel. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap us up. And in the spirit of, we, we have such a rich food community that's come together tonight. And in the spirit of sort of sharing resources, I'm going to throw out actually an offer from someone. Um, Claire, who works at the food pantry in town, is wondering if anyone would be interested in their bread waste. They have 100 to 300 pounds of bread waste every week. Um, and Claire, if you want to put your email back in the chat, I know you put it in there once, but go ahead and put it in there again. If any connections can be made, I feel like we're in like lost connections. We're like in the classified act right now. Um, but if anyone wants to make that connection happen, go for it. Um, and then we will finish up our night with one more question. And this one is for you guys. Um, hopefully, if nothing else, you leave inspired to do something in your own life to alter your diet, to decrease your carbon footprint, meet your neighbors, learn more about Alaska um, and celebrate what we have here in our state. So what will you do in the next week to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions associated with your diet? Same deal, either scan that QR code with your phone, go to slido.com and put in that number 90115. And please share your ideas. I'm curious what's, what steps you are going to take to um, to look more closely and be reflective about the food that you eat. Nice. 
save your scraps for stock. That's great. We have some chicken soup on the on the oven right now, actually. Um, I'm already vegan, but we'll do more foraging. That's a, it's awesome. Like there's always something that you can do. Start seeds that we that is on tap for us in the next week or so. It's getting it's getting late. Um, preservation is so fun. <laughs> there are so many things that you can um, preserve. And once you start doing that, your fridge will be full of pickles and your, your shelves will be full of uh, jams. Use up the food in the back of the fridge and freezer. Totally. I mean, that is like number one, never throw any food away. <laughs> there should be no food waste coming out of your house. It's, it might take a little bit of planning, a little bit of being creative. Um, but if all else fails, you can get chickens and feed it to them. There should be no way food waste coming out of anyone's house. Buy food without horrible packaging. I agree. Yeah. Um, there's all, you know, the we had a, a slight reprieve for plastic ba plastic bags during COVID. Our our stores are going to be going back to paper bags. So get used to bringing your totes back to the stores. Um, yep. Use all the food. Continue composting. Oh yeah. So I will I will wrap us up. Um, by giving us a plug. Remember for the April event is gonna be on um, consumption and solid waste. You'll learn a lot more about composting, including the Muni, the Muni program to pick up your compost. If you don't wanna deal with it in your backyard, you can send it home with the municipality of Anchorage and they can make soil for the rest of Anchorage residents. Um, and with that, I am gonna turn it back over to Dick to wrap us up and say thanks again to everybody. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Micah and all our speakers, Amy, Kyla, Robbie, Nick, Cindy, Mark, Lori, Shelly, Jackie, Caitlin, Jason, Tikhan, Sarah, and Rachel. I think I got everybody there. Um, it was a very interesting and informative discussion. Missing from this Zoom presentation is the applause that you should be getting from everyone that's watching tonight. Um, special thanks to Kari Gardi, who has been running the Zoom show this evening, along with Stacey McGordy monitoring the chat and technical assistance from Katie Doherty. This event has been organized by co-chairs Kari Gardy and Mary Lou Harrow, along with awesome committee, including board member Peg Tileston and Alaska Common Ground members, Gretchen Nelson, Cami Dalton, Betsy Baker, and Shara Sutherland. And Gretchen was monitoring the time of everybody and playing the harmonica in the background. So thank you, Gretchen, for the harmonica tunes. Um, Thank you for supporting and attending this event. If you're not a member, please go to our website, Alaska or akcommonground.org to join or make a donation to support Alaska Common Ground's work towards an engaged Alaska democracy. Uh, there should be a link in the chat for donations. And remember to join us Thursday, April 29th, seven o'clock, as we discuss how reducing our consumption in solid waste can help us meet our climate action goals in Anchorage. And with that, I wanna thank everybody. Please stay healthy. Stay engaged and have a good evening. Thank you again.